Hello and welcome to another edition of Hariba Raman Academy. In this installment we'll discuss Raman spectroscopy and specifically micro Raman spectroscopy uh, as we apply it to molecular electronic materials. And uh, in particular we're going to see the effects of orientation and crystallinity in these molecular or organic electronic materials manifest in the in the Raman spectra. This is just a short talk and we will cover just these topics. Uh, first, uh, an introduction or reintroduction, I'm sure to many of you, of the field effect transistor and specifically the spatial scale of integrated molecular electronics which is large relative to that for the silicon based or gallium arsenide based integrated electronics and therefore makes it suitable for optical microscopy and optical microspectroscopy. And then give you an example with uh, rubrine which is uh, a material along with pentacene that are commonly used uh, these days by many uh, scientists to try to fabricate uh, integrated electronic circuitry with uh, organic compounds. So here's a diagram of uh, the field effect transistor and so what we see are is the familiar structure. We have a source, drain, a gate. What's different in the case of an organic uh, semiconductor is that we're essentially replacing silicon uh, that had, which is ordinarily doped with N or P type dopants with uh, an organic semiconductor and generally speaking it's crystalline. Today we'll discuss the results of micro Raman spectroscopy of rubrine, rubrine grains taken right out of uh, the reagent bottle. And so why are we interested in molecular electronics or, or uh, integrated electronics based on organic compounds. Well, it is definitely not to replace uh, silicon-based integrated electronics and chips and that sort of thing. Principally, it's to apply uh, integrated electronics on display and displays on substrates that are flexible and for applications where the rigidity of uh, the conventional semiconductor substrates would just preclude that uh, particular application. All right, well, one of the uh, compounds that I mentioned that's frequently used is rubrine. And in this diagram that you see here, uh, it's rather helpful that the authors in, in their uh, sketch or their diagram show a rubrine crystal as the active medium in, the, in, in their transistor. Now why do I say that? Well that's because the important characteristics such as electron and hole mobilities are highly dependent upon the solid state structure and it turns out that those electron and hole mobilities are highest in crystalline materials and not just polycrystalline but single crystalline materials and along specific crystalline axes. And this is where the polarization and orientation sensitivity of Raman spectroscopy comes into play. All right, well, what is the structure of rubrine? What is this compound? Well, it's uh, essentially a compound of uh, uh, fused and bonded uh, phenyl groups. All right, and here you see just uh, one uh, a, a diagram of uh, one molecule of rubrine. However, at room temperature, it uh, it does assume the solid state and generally the crystalline solid state. And the most general forms are in the orthorhombic crystal system assuming the crystal class of either C2V or D2H as you see here. Now generally uh, the, the rubrine that you'll encounter certainly out of the bottle and that's uh, often fabricated is D2H uh, crystal, crystal class and so that's that's what we'll deal with here and here you see a schematic 
uh, of the and this is very important of the of the let's say the crystal habit with respect to the crystal axes so kind of keep this in mind as we proceed here now for uh, a crystal in the D2H crystal class the Raman active modes are dictated by that crystal structure and in rubrine there are four Raman active modes AG, B1G, B2G, and B3G. These are the only Raman active modes that uh, uh, that are in play and these are the Raman tensors for them and uh, what you see then are where there are letters A, B, C, D, E, and F those letters indicate non-zero values for those tensor elements. All the other tensor elements are, are then zero. Now why is that important? Well, uh, when considering the Raman scattering, and here we have uh, a simplified expression for the Raman scattering cross-section and its uh, proportionality to, or the Raman scattering cross-section with respect to the solid angle and its dependence then on the incident electric field in conjunction with the Raman tensor and the scattering vector. Now what's important is that the orientation of that crystal is going to dictate how this tensor presents itself to the uh, incident electric field and the scattering vector which will be fixed in a micro Raman experiment. Now what do I mean by that? How can we understand that a little better? Well, here are two diagrams of rubrine in the D2H crystal class and they're essentially the same crystal structure but they're just oriented differently. So you look at them and you say my they're really quite different. Well no, in fact they're the same crystal structure but we're just looking at them along uh, different axes so that if you envision yourself as a laser beam heading towards this this crystal of rubrine then depending on how it's oriented uh, I think you could then anticipate the different interactions of the vibrational modes and the phonons with uh, the incident electric field. Here again this is the same crystal structure D2H only at different orientations relative to your field of view or the incident beam coming at the uh, coming at the crystal and this last structure is going to be very important because what I've labeled here are the crystallographic axes so this happens to be uh, the orientation of a crystal habit that is favored in the formation or crystallization of the rubrine. And here are two reflected light images of rubrine grains taken right out of the bottle. So here's grain R1, which I've selected because it really is, has kind of a random orientation, whereas R3, and probably is polycrystalline, whereas R3 has a, a very specific crystal habit which you can see and we can then impose the uh, or superimpose the the crystallographic axes uh, on on this habit and then see what kind of differences we obtain in the Raman spectra obtained from these two grains at these locations where you see the green dot okay so Raman's now we're going to look at the Raman spectra obtained from those different grains at that green dot. So the blue spectrum is the case of uh, R3, Raman uh, rubrine grain 3, in which we're looking at the C face and therefore our polarization, our incident polarization was fixed in the AB plane. And the red trace is with the other grain which for all I know is uh, polycrystalline and so you see the dramatic differences in the Raman spectra of these grains simply because of crystallization and orientation all right and these are both on the plotted on the same scale same absolute scale 
and uh, spectra were collected together. Now, let's take a look at uh, some grains, each with the uh, reflected light images of the sea face of the rubrine grains. But notice that they are they're oriented 90 degrees with respect to each other. So this is another oh roughly let's say roughly single crystal with the uh, with the tip broken off and here is another uh, s single grain or let's uh, yeah let's safely call it a single grain and that's oriented 90 degrees with respect uh, to this grain so what is it that we see and I've included the uh, the previous spectrum in the, in the AB plane as well if we compare these micro Raman spectra of two grains obtained with the beam incident upon the C face, we find that for two entirely different grains, their spectra are remarkably similar, which is what we would expect based upon group theory and the Raman selection rules for crystal orientation and the polarization. And now we come to this case where Again, we're looking at a single grain, probably in the same uh, uh, crystal orientation, except that it's rotated 90 degrees with respect to these others. And so now we see the difference, differences, I should say, in the relative intensities of these Raman bands, uh, particularly at a thousand four wave numbers. You look at these differences here compared to uh, the bands at 1302, 1434, and 1524. So notice the difference now just by rotating the crystal 90 degrees with respect to these others so that you can see how even for a single grain the Raman spectroscopy with its incident polarized light is very sensitive to the orientation of the crystal and not just that it's crystalline as well. So let's sum up how we can think about the use of micro Raman spectroscopy in molecular electronics. Uh, we can think about using it with integrated electronics, photovoltaics, and displays. And why is that? Well, because the spatial scale is uh, and here I'm jumping ahead of myself, but that's all right, because the spatial scale of the molecular electronics is conducive to optical microspectroscopy. Your spatial resolution is well suited for the dimensions that you'll find in uh, these organic electronics, so to speak. Uh, you have a variety of organic compounds and polymers as well as preparative conditions that are used. So the the chemistry and the solid state structure are far more complex in molecular electronics than in say uh, silicon circuit fabrication and so the the value of vibration of vibrational spectroscopy of these solid state materials I think is very clear because you are then able to uh, probe and to uh, characterize the solid state structure, for example, the crystallinity, which is so important and its architecture needs to be controlled in order to gain the electronic performance that one needs, specifically with respect to electron and hole mobility. And uh, let me just point out that uh, I say this frequently that if one can use X ray diffraction, to get the information you need about crystal structure or orientation, absolutely you should do that. What uh, I am suggesting here is that where it is not practical to apply X-ray diffraction, particularly if you need uh, spatial resolution or mapping out of areas to confirm relative or, uh, orientations from one location to another of your crystalline materials, than uh, polarized Raman spectroscopy, and specifically micro Raman spectroscopy, is a very good approach to take.